I sense something unusual is getting ready to happen. And that is that God is getting ready to release unusual mercy upon you. If you will walk in mercy, God will begin to pour out mercy on you and something's getting ready to happen. It's going to happen in our country. It's going to happen. It's going to be very difficult, but we're going to be blessed. Power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory. And welcome today to Word Alive. I'm Pastor Bob Rogers. And I want to thank you for joining us. I have a book that I want to send to you. It's a book that, that uh, I've, I've just completed. It's entitled, uh, 30 Proverbs That Bring Health, Long Life, and Prosperity. I've read the book of Proverbs over 600 times and have memorized much of the book of Proverbs. These are my 30 favorite Proverbs and some of the most powerful words of wisdom that I've ever received from God. The Bible says get wisdom and get understanding. 30 Proverbs that bring health, long life, and wealth. And all that information's right there, and we'll rush it right to you. Now, one other thing, we're going to go into our program, but at the conclusion, we're going to pray, and I'm going to serve you communion. So many of you uh, maybe have been shut in, or you've been in a place where you haven't been able to receive the communion. I want you to get some bread and some juice or whatever you can get uh, as symbolic of the communion, the bread and the, and the, and the cup, and we're going to take communion together. But right now, let's go into our program. And the Bible says, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Years ago, I was preaching up in, up in Iowa. And uh, I prayed for a couple. This guy was, uh, had been a professional football player. And his wife was a very beautiful lady. And she was pregnant. And so they came and I prayed for him. He said, you know, this is a miracle baby. I says, it is. He says, yeah. He said, I had a vasectomy, and she still got pregnant. He said, there's a miracle. I said, well, that's, that's great. He says, I believe God got something very special for that baby. Well, about uh, seven months later, I get a call one night from a preacher. He's down in Alabama, and he said, Pastor Bob, he said, I just felt led to call you. I was praying. My wife and I can't have any children. And I felt while I was in prayer that God told me to call you. And I said, well, I, I don't know. Um, I can't help you out here. I don't know of any children that are up for adoption or anything. He said, well, maybe God just wants you to pray for me. So I prayed for him. And then the next morning, this couple from Iowa called me. And what happened was uh, it wasn't that big a miracle. Um, she had had an affair with a, with a neighbor. And uh, the fact is, uh, he went when he found out, he had gone over to that neighbor and they would got into a fight and his neighbor had hit him in the head with a hammer. And uh, there, was, uh, there was permanent damage and they said that uh, what we'd like to do, we're going to put this baby up for adoption. And we're looking for a good orphanage, and do you know of one? I said, well, actually, I know a couple who want, who want the, uh, a baby. And it was really through the goodness of God that we were able to place that baby into that home of the pastor. Well, they uh, eventually moved to North Carolina, and he took a church there. And years later, I get a phone call. It's this pastor and his, and his wife. And on the line is that daughter. She was beautiful. Her name, her, her, she, was, she was blonde now. She could play the, the instruments. Uh, she played the organ. She could sing. And she was graduating from high school. And she said, Uncle Bob, she said, I want to meet my mama, my biological mother. Do you think you could maybe 
call them and talk to them to see if I could just talk to them. I know I've got probably other brothers and sisters, and i just like to talk to them. I said, well, let me see what I can work out. And so I, I called, and, and they said, no, we don't want to talk to her. We don't want to talk to her. Well, it just it broke her heart. I, I told her, I said, you know, it's not ready right now. But it broke her heart, and she cried, and she cried. And it, it was something that was just a real difficult situation for her because adopted children, many times, they, they need closure. And there are, are demons that come against adopted children of rejection. And when something just natural happens, it doesn't work out, many times these, these demons, they said, no, they don't, you're, you, they don't want, want you, and they don't like you. It, it's, it's awful. And so I, I said, God, you're the only one that can put this together. You're the only one that can work that out. And probably two years passed. And one day in the service on a Sunday morning, a doctor was in the service and he came up and he was from this town where that couple was. And I got talking to him and we went out after church and we, we had dinner. And I told him this story. He said, well, you know, that girl's sister works for me. And she's often wondered whatever happened to that little baby. And I said, well, I said, I sure, I sure can help you out here. And so he called that girl. He called that sister. She was so elated. She said, you know, that is such an answer to prayer. And so I got them together, and they began to email each other. And then she eventually went out, and she was reunited. She met for the first time her biological sister, and her biological brother. Now, how many know that is the mercies of God? That is just the goodness of God that takes place. We had a, a lady in this church, and she, uh, she was uh, in a, a real difficult marriage. She, uh, she worked uh, just minimum wage at one of the big department stores, and she she came here, and she went on a 21-day fast. And she came to me, and she said, Pastor Bob, she said, uh, said you know, I'm adopted. And uh, I don't know why I'm talking this way. Maybe there's some folks here that uh, you need to hear this. She said, uh, I'm adopted, and I've always uh, wondered who my biological parents were. And, uh, and I'm fasting this 21 days that God will work something out for me to let me find out who my parents are. And also, I need, a, I need a raise. Well, she fasts during these 21 days, and at the conclusion of the fast, um, her friend called her, and she said to her, she said, you know, she said, um, you told me you were, you were praying that God would help you to find your biological family. There's, there's a, a, a lady who came in, with, uh, and she told her what she thought her name was, and she has that name. And uh, she said, and she worked as a receptionist for this doctor. And she said, well, I wonder if she's my mother. And so uh, she called this lady, and the lady turned out to be her mother. And uh, they got together, and God answered that prayer, and then... At her job, God elevated her, and she became the head of that department. Now, what is this? That is the mercies of God, and it's released when people pray. It's released when people fast. And God wants us to be merciful people. Now, if you don't ever plan to make a mistake in your life, then you treat people ugly and mean all you want to. But if you ever make a mistake and you've never showed mercy to other people, I've got news for you. Nobody is going to ever show mercy to you. And if you want mercy to come back to you, then you need to be merciful to other people. In the Bible, there's a story about the sons of Eli. These guys were rascals. These guys were were adulterers, they, they stole money, they treated people bad. 
And when Israel got into a war against the Philistines, they took the Ark of the Covenant and they took that to battle and the Philistines beat the Israelites and took the Ark. And God spoke and he said, because of the sins of these, uh, these young men, uh, a curse is placed on this family. The family of Eli, the sons, will not live out their days They'll die young. And that was a curse that was placed on that family, and that went for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I read the story about a rabbi, how a rabbi went into one of the villages in Israel of the sons of Eli. And he noticed there weren't any old people. Everybody was young. And so when he talked to the elders of that community they said you know I want you to pray please pray rabbi that God will somehow forgive our sins and he'll have mercy on us and uh, our our children will live longer so that rabbi that night God spoke to him and there's a great scripture in the book of Proverbs Proverbs and I want to read it Proverbs chapter 12 and it's the last verse in Proverbs and here's what it says Well, I'll just quote it. I can't find it. In the path of righteousness is life, and in it there is no death. And what it means in the path of righteousness is life. The word righteous in righteousness means charitable giving to the poor. And so in giving to the poor, God extends your life. And in it there is no death, or in other words, that blessing will carry on over when you get to heaven. So this rabbi said to this, he said, you know, if you help poor people, God extends your life and you'll live longer. If you help feed the hungry, you won't die before your time and God may extend it even a lot longer. And so that village, they got together and they began to do a programs reaching out to other villages to help the poor and to help the needy. When that happened, that curse, that curse was broken, and God, in His mercy, began to extend their days. Now, what I'm talking about is God wants us to begin to practice mercy. And what really matters in life is you loving other people and you helping people that you don't even know. Reaching out to people in need really gets God's attention. And when people begin to pray and they begin to ask for the mercy of God, God begins to release that mercy in a great and powerful way. I had dinner with a, a man this week, and he's a preacher, he's a, dear, he's a friend of mine. And back during the time of Saddam Hussein, a lot of people were, were being persecuted, a lot of trouble. Uh, he was a dictator of uh, Iraq. And in this time, in this time, let me come down here where I can, where I can share this. Uh, they were praying for his capture. And he had a dream. And in this dream, he saw Saddam Hussein's um, body with a young face on it. With a young face. He saw him, uh, or, or, or he saw, he saw a little boy's body with Saddam's face on it. And then he saw him in this village, and there was a white wall, there was a tree, and he was buried under the ground. And so he woke up and he said, I don't know what that means. And so anyway, in this process, uh, he, uh, he um, uh, the governor, he uh, had a meeting with the governor that week. He said, you know, governor, I had this dream about Saddam Hussein. And he told him the dream. And the governor says, is that right? He said, that's very, very interesting. Well, that afternoon, the CIA called him. And this governor had contacted him in Washington. They called him and said, we understand you had a dream. And he told him about the dream. He said, what do you think it means? He says, well, that, that, that body of a, a boy with his head on it probably is back where he grew up. 
And I saw this white wall and a, and a tree, and he was buried underneath it. That evening on the news, they caught Saddam Hussein in his hometown. There was a white wall, there was a tree, and there was an underground bunker under that tree. And so they, uh, they said, you can't tell anybody this story for two years. If not, they'll probably, somebody will try to kill you. But how many know that is the mercies of God, how that happens? I had a, I, I was with a fellow, and I, I won't, I can't tell this in the next service, and, but don't repeat me. Uh, <laughs> this fellow had an iron, had a, he, he made uh, iron. He had a, a, a metal thing, and he had a contract with the United States government making some kind of uh, things for them. And uh, he was at a golf tournament, a professional golf tournament. And there was this guy who's real famous for a putter. And he has a contract with that putter, that, that company, with one of the largest golfing companies. I won't even tell the name of it. And so um, he said, you know, I can make that putter for you. He said, you can? He said, yeah, I, I can make putters. He said, I know exactly how to do it. And so he made him a putter. And the guy said, man, this is a nice putter. He said, can you make a putter that he told him how? He said, yeah, I can make that. So he made that for him. And so this guy, this guy put his name on that putter, and he sold it to the largest golf guys, company in the world. And uh, he ended up, this fellow ended up getting $10 million for doing this, but he could never use his name. So in this process, one of the greatest golfers in the history of golf came along and they said, could you make him a putter? He said, yeah, give me his height and all. So he made him a putter. He said, we believe this, this kid is going to really win a lot of golf. And he, he, won, he won that golf tournament. Then he turned around and won a second golf tournament. Then he turned around and won a third golf tournament using his putter. Well, it made Titleist, I mean, uh, it made this company uh, just <laughs> all kind of money. And so in, but they never would let him put his name on it. So this Japanese company came along. And this Japanese company said, look, if you will make our putters, you can put your name on it. And they offered him a fabulous offer. And so that's what he began to do. So when that happened, that number, American company, sued him. Sued him to take everything that he had. And so his lawyer says, I don't know what we can do. He says, they're coming after you. They're going to try to bar you and take everything you've got so in this time he fasts his name's first name's bob and he fast started fasting and praying and god reminded him of something and he went and he began to look in his records and he suddenly discovered something and the putter that he made for titleist most outstanding golfer was illegal. He had won those three tournaments with an illegal putter. Are y'all listening today? What am I preaching on? What, what's my subject today? You need to have what? Mercy. Now he's on the verge of losing every, look, look, what I'm telling you is the God's truth. Fact is, he's going to send me one of those putters. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> So he told his lawyer, he said, that was an illegal, he said, the fact is, he said, I, uh, he said I, I, I called this guy, whose name they put on that putter, he called Titleist, and Titleist um, went and got this guy's putter before the, uh, next, before the masters, and pulled that putter and flew it to him at 2 a.m. in the morning. He worked on it until 5 a.m. He got it legal, and they took it back and put it in the bag and said, 
Nobody can know this. We're keeping this silent. This lawyer says, that's all I needed to know. Did you know when they announced they were going to release that news, Tylus dropped the lawsuit. The lawyer tripled, had tripled his charges, and so they paid the lawyer. And they gave $5 million to my friend to keep his mouth shut. And now Callaway has offered him a $50 million contract, which he can use his name on that putter. Now, folks, that's how the mercy of God works. And that's how God wants us to be merciful to other people. Now, I sense something unusual is getting ready to happen. And that is that God is getting ready to release unusual mercy upon you. If you will walk in mercy, God will begin to pour out mercy on you and something's getting ready to happen. It's going to happen in our country. It's going to happen. It's going to be very difficult, but we're going to be blessed. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. A palm tree is, uh, is in the middle of the desert when nothing else blooms. A palm tree's there. It says we'll grow up as the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon denote nobility, royalty. It's in the houses and palaces of kings. And that's what God's going to do for each of you. Raise your right hand. Say in the name of Jesus, I'm a merciful person. I'm merciful even to my enemies. I'm not mad at anybody. I love everybody. God's anointing me. This is a season of God's great mercy upon me and my household. In Jesus' name. I want everyone to stand. I want you to place your hand over your heart. I want you to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask for your mercy in my life. Your mercy on my family, on my home, on my children, on my finances. Lord, in your great mercy, may I not get sick. May no disease come in my home. May every generational curse be broken off of me. Family members who've died with cancer, that cancer won't come on my life. That curse is broken in Jesus' name. Father, anoint me to be a blessing to everybody, even people I don't know. Let me bless them in Jesus' name. Forgive me of my sins. If I were to die right now, may I have the confidence I'd go to heaven. Every mistake's under the blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you, if you need mercy, start giving mercy out this week. Look for ways how you can be kind to people, even people who don't deserve it. Treat them like royalty and see what God will do for you. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm glad. well, praise God. I hope you enjoyed today's program. And again, I want to encourage you uh, to get the book that I've, I've written. I've written it for you. I've written it to be a blessing to you. Uh, you can go to my website, bobrogersministries.org, and it shows how you can get that book. And uh, I ask you to plant a seed, and as many as can to plant a seed of $30, and I'll rush this book to you, 30 Proverbs that bring health, long life, and prosperity. And uh, you'll get it within just uh, a few days, and uh, it'll bless you. But I want to take communion. And if you don't have your em emblems of communion, uh, I want you to go get something, get some bread, uh, get some juice if you have juice. If you don't, uh, you know, I've, I've done whatever I can do sometimes when I want to take communion. I've taken it with coffee. I took it with Coke. And uh, they become emblems. They become symbols. And, but the, the, the true power is in the faith. The faith believing God, that God's going to do something. 
This is a picture. This is an invitation where you're inviting Jesus to come right now into your room, to come right now and sit down beside you. You may be on the couch. You may be at the kitchen table, wherever you are. Jesus, when we take the communion, comes right to where you are. And everything he did at the cross is covered right here in this communion. The communion was a picture, actually, of the Seder meal that took place at Passover. The Jews would take this Seder meal, and in that Seder meal, there was victory. There was healings. Many people would get healed when they ate the Seder meal. The Bible says in Psalms, he brought them forth with silver and with gold, and there was not a feeble one amongst the tribes. So in the Passover, there was healing, there was prosperity, and there was deliverance. And they could only do it once a year. Once a year, they would wait. They would wait till the Passover and to celebrate the Passover. And then many, as they would go through there, they would believe God and actually be healed. So Paul had this revelation. He said, I received this of the Lord. I mean, it was not something he was taught. It was something that Jesus showed him, that we could take the communion and it was just like the miracles that happened at the Passover. So everything that happened at the cross would happen to us. And so he says, as oft as you do it, in other words, you don't have to wait for one time a year, but you can take this every day. You can take it once a week. You can take it once a month. As oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me discerning the Lord's body. And then he calls it the cup of blessing. So when we eat today, there's a blessing that's going to come on you that would not have happened if you hadn't taken the communion with us. Are you ready? I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I belong to you. I'm not a part of the devil's crowd. I'm a part of the body of Christ. Cleanse me from every sin. Take out of me what the devil's put in me. Pray it with me and put back in me what the devil's taken out of me in Jesus' name. By your stripes I'm healed. Through the crown of thorns I'm prosperous. The curse is broken. I receive forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. Let's drink together. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's program. And again, go to my website, bobrogersministries.org, and it shows you how you can get the book, 30 Proverbs That Bring Health, Long Life, and Prosperity. I know you'll enjoy it. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next week at the same time. Signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.